By accepting and respecting all cultures, has Canada also accepted certain cultural ideals that denigrate women? Our next guest says harmful customs and traditions have been hiding under the protective curtain of multiculturalism, and she says it's time to pull back that curtain to have a difficult conversation about what's been hidden. So let's do that. Joining us now with more, we welcome back Irshad Manji, professor at New York University and author of Allah, Liberty and Love, The Courage to Reconcile Faith and Freedom. One of the reasons I think my family and I were even allowed to come to Canada as refugees from back Uganda. in 1972 from Uganda mm -hmm. is that Pierre Trudeau was just unveiling the multiculturalism policy at that time. So we fit into his vision, but it's interesting that his vision was not the kind of multiculturalism that we are experiencing today, and here's what I mean. Trudeau actually pointed out that uh, national unity, if it is to mean anything, he said, in the deeply personal sense, has to be founded on one's own confidence in one's individual identity. What we've got today is a lot of groupthink, not individuality but group think. And this is what culture and celebrating all cultural differences can lead to. Some cultural differences ought to be celebrated. They're benign and even lovely, but other cultural differences, not so much. And we've come to a point, I think, in Canada where we're afraid. We're afraid of being called racists and bigots if we point out that not all cultural differences deserve to be tolerated. For example? Well, you know, uh, as a Muslim, and as a Muslim who is often critical of the way in which my faith is being practiced, I love my faith as it should be, but I have issues with the way it's often being practiced, you're and still, one of that... You're still a refusenik? I'm still a Muslim, Muslim who loves yeah. independent thinking, okay. and uh, the culture of honor, the particular custom of group honor that has infected uh, the way my faith is practiced means that women in particular uh, are subject to violence if they transgress certain moral boundaries. And we see cases like this in Canada, Aksa Parvez yep. a couple of years ago and the Shafia uh, honor crimes in Kingston, uh, in Kingston exactly, mm -hmm. even, even uh, uh, later than that. And I think it's time for us to point out that multiculturalism as an ideal is wonderful, make no mistake about it. But because it seeks to preserve, not challenge, but preserve all that is part of culture, what we sometimes find is that the ideal of women's equality bumps up against the aspiration to diversity. And I think that there's a way of going forward that builds on multiculturalism, but doesn't stay where we are right now. Okay, but is it also fair to say, look, of course we love multiculturalism, but not the parts of multiculturalism that involve female genital mutilation or not the parts of multiculturalism that involve honor killings. Yeah. That goes without saying. Is no, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't eh? go without saying, not at all. Look, I'm an educator. I, uh, I teach at New York University and I come back to Canada quite often to speak with other educators about what's happening in their classrooms and sometimes even in the families of their students. And one of the things that educators tell me routinely is how uh, fearful they are of starting honest conversations about the right and wrong of cultural preservation within their own classrooms. Why what the are fear? they afraid? Right. Yeah. They're afraid that parents will complain. They're afraid that peers will sort of dishonor them as, uh, as being prejudiced. When in fact, what they want to do is uh, liberate the space, the classroom space, to be about critical thinking, about independent thinking, and not just about uh, being nice to one another. Hmm. Uh, lest we give the impression that this is simply quote unquote, a Muslim thing, right. we should add that there is obviously plenty of stuff that goes on in, for example, uh, ultra-Orthodox Judaism or mm -hmm. in Catholicism or in, you know, And even in make secularism, even in or secularism. In secularism. The sure. fact of the matter is that today we still have a reality in this wonderful country where, you know, uh, boys who have a lot of uh, girlfriends, for example, are referred to as players and girls who have a lot of boyfriends and even just friends who are boys are often referred to as sluts. There's a clear double standard. And I think what's interesting, you know, when it comes to sort of peeling back the curtain, as you rightly pointed out, about multicultural is that uh, we know that the vast majority of cultures around the world 
are patriarchal, including our own. And by patriarchal, you know, I know it's a kind of a, an academic word, but it simply means this. It means that the desires and drives and demands of men in these cultures carry weight, more weight, and sometimes a lot more weight than those of women. So and long, so, long continuum. Okay, We're it is one a, spot on it, and there are others that And are, there are others right. exactly right. But now when you pair that fact about living in male-dominated societies, when you pair that fact with what multiculturalism is about, namely preserving cultures, then in fact, what you have is an ultra patriarchal kind of model where you know people are afraid to say well if I point out that there is something profoundly unequal about somebody else's culture and not just my own I'm gonna be told that I'm really un-Canadian for pointing that out and really mm. we should just shut up and get on with making nice let me read this from the Boston Review this is a long time ago but um, yeah good time to get a sip of water because I'm gonna read something here feminism and multiculturalism may find themselves allied in academic politics where white women and minority women and men face common enemies, great books, dead white men, old boy networks, job discrimination, and so forth. But as political visions in the larger world, they are very far apart. In its demand for equality for women, feminism sets itself in opposition to virtually every culture on earth. You could say that multiculturalism demands respect for all cultural traditions, while feminism respects only traditions that indeed deserve respect. Feminists might disagree about strategic issues, what needs changing first, or how to ensure one isn't just making things worse, or how to win over enough people. Feminists might even disagree about what true equality is in a given instance. But fundamentally, the ethical claims of feminism run counter to the cultural relativism of group rights multiculturalism. Okay, Urshet, lots to unpack here, so let's go through this. Can gender equality and multiculturalism peacefully coexist? I do believe they can, but it's going to require, Steve, a big shift in our mindset as Canadians. And here's what I mean, speaking of unpacking words. Mm. I think we as Canadians have uh, the, the opportunity to love diversity more than to love multiculturalism. People constantly confuse these two things, diversity and multiculturalism, but in fact, they're not at all the What's same. What's the difference? Right. So diversity is about more than just your religion and my skin color. Diversity is also about differences in thought, in opinion, in point of view. Now, here's the thing. Uh, different points of view are naturally going to offend different people. So offense, and this is the hard truth that we as Canadians have to start grappling with, offense is not- Not such a, a bad thing. Well, it's not uh, something to be avoided at all costs. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, offense is the cost of honest diversity. And that is something that educators, policy makers, and let's be honest, politicians are also uh, very mindful of. They often won't go there. You want to give an example of something that uh, you're not allowed to say out loud in this country because of the concerns you just raised? You know, I've already talked about uh, 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 the honor, the honor crimes, and right. the honor killings that are that do infect some communities in this country, and have also infected Catholic communities um, in years past. But let me tell you about something that I experienced in the United States not too long ago in New York, where I live. Um, I was at a, a school for uh, uh, ch girls, actually girls at risk, meaning uh, African American girls, Hispanic girls, and newly immigrant girls. And uh, one of them asked this question which I thought was just fascinating. She said, why is it that when a white guy calls somebody like me a nappy-headed hoe, uh, he's a racist, which he probably is, but when my own brother, literally like my own biological brother, calls me that, um, he's an entertainer, he's a performer. Why that double standard? Hmm. And you should have seen the other girls in class look at her, not in horror shock, but in relief shock as if to say, oh my God, you too? You've been thinking that too? And what we came up with was a vibrant conversation about what it means to own yourself, to own uh, your own autonomy. Exactly, frankly, what Pierre Trudeau was talking about, but without the fear of speaking your truth. Hmm. So that's the explanation why it's okay for 
African Americans to call one another the N word, but nobody else better do it. Right, exactly. And, and of course, this girl is saying, but it's not okay. But then it's we not have okay. to call out our own brothers and sisters. Hmm. And, and because if we don't, then in fact, we're practicing a different kind of racism where we're reducing quote unquote white guys to their skin color and sometimes their maleness. And we're kind of letting our own pass. Hmm with the same bad behavior. We suggested in the intro that multiculturalism is, I think it's fair to say, is as much a part of what it means to be yes. Canadian today as, you know, you gotta love hockey, our right. Medicare system, all that kind of right. stuff. And I do, especially now that I live in the United yeah. States. Oh. I certainly do appreciate our healthcare system that much more. <laughs> Have you signed up for the registry or whatever, they, <laughs> whatever it is down there? Do you no. think Canadians are, are, as a result, hesitant to ask any questions about multiculturalism? You know, it's interesting. I don't think that we're hesitant to ask questions in private. I think a lot of us have questions when other people are not expecting us to be on script. Hmm. But again, in public spaces, people are afraid. And I'm here to say, if you love diversity, then also love the fact that all of us will have a different point of view and that we should be willing to engage one another right. in that point of view. Why? Because if we avoid ask, uh, asking each other searching questions, then in effect, what we're doing is uh, infantilizing each other. We're, you know, implicitly treating one another like children. That's not respect. You're too that immature to handle a serious exactly. conversation. Exactly. You're not my peer. You're mm -hmm. not my equal. That's really what's at the bottom of it. And I'm saying that's not respect. That's disrespect, and moreover, that is dishonest diversity. So the fear that you just referred to is based on what? What are we afraid of happening if we have this conversation? Well, if could you, Steve, tell me in all honesty, do you think that you could begin this conversation, uh, that you have issues with multiculturalism, here's why, and be told that, yeah, it's fine to be hearing this from a white guy? Yeah, that's not a great example. Sorry, I should say. No, no, it's fair. not a great that's example fair. because I don't give opinions on anything on this program. No, but right? you see, I think that's a cop out. If you okay, no, but it's okay, true. okay. So let me let me put it this way. You know, when 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 um, when somebody uh, was asking me the other day, uh, what kinds of you know examples could I give? As I was going through a number of examples, he said to me, "You know what? I just realized as a white guy, I wouldn't be able to say this." I'm stuff. not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to say. Now <laughs> I could. Hmm. But I know what would be coming my way if which, I did. Which would be what? You're a racist, dude. How can you possibly do that? Consequences. Don't you know? Don't you know that you're not allowed to go there? Hmm. At which point, I think the white dude ought to be asking why. Why are you reducing me to my skin color? Let's engage. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying you're right. Let's actually have an honest discussion about this and see where we both end up. And you know, you mentioned when you were reading Katha Pollitt's uh, quote, mm -hmm. she uses this very sort of big scholarly phrase, cultural relativism. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out relativism simply means that you stand, uh, that, you, that you fall for anything because you stand for nothing. What I'm arguing for is pluralism, which is that you're allowed to make judgments but make them your starting point. Don't make them your finish line. In other words, have your judgments and then recognize that uh, you know, your judgments are contingent. They're temporary. They're based on two other things. They're uh, based on having uh, more experiences in life and hearing better arguments down the road. And therefore, you can change your mind. But if you come to the table with no opinions, then actually you're being dishonest not just to other people, but also to yourself. Yeah, no, you know I've got opinions, but it's just part of my job to shut up about So them. I get it, yeah. I get it that in this context, you can't go there. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying as citizens, and this is why I think that my argument is not ultimately about policy, and it's not ultimately about, you know, um, um, about institutions, mm -hmm. it's about us. It's about individuals, it's about people, and what kind of a society we want in the next generation. Multiculturalism was great, for, uh, as a policy for the time that we were still coming to terms with what the world of, of mass immigration meant. We're, we've come to terms with that in this country. Now it's time to go a step further and recognize that creativity and innovation, which is what I think the first 50 years of the 21st century will be about, that requires freedom of thought. And we can't really give that gift to our youth if we are telling them that they're only allowed to think certain things, and if they think other things, then don't express them. Yeah, I, my hunch is though that today's youth are not um, inhibited in the way that perhaps 
our generation is in, in as much as uh, people see me and they might see a white middle-aged guy. They might see you and they might see a you know, Muslim woman. They're way more colorblind today, right? Young kids today, they just don't see these kinds no, of... No, I disagree. You disagree? No, quite the opposite. Really? I think that kids today have been um, socialized to see labels first. And that doesn't oh. mean that they have issues with the labels. Of course they don't. But, you know, if they see me as a brown, let's say, Muslim chick first, then um, I think it stands to reason that they're going to assume certain things about, you know, where I stand, that if they didn't assume those things, then maybe they'd be uh, willing to ask me questions instead of assuming those things. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and that's what I'm talking about when I uh, refer to innovation and creativity. Um, you know, we, we take those things for granted in a country as supposedly free as ours. But I think that we put limits on ourselves by first pigeonholing people. Witness how many times I'm told by young Canadians, I wish, Irshad, that people would stop asking me where I come from and where my family comes mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. I'm not a South Asian Canadian. I'm not an Indo-Canadian. Yeah. I'm a Canadian. Canadian Let go yeah. of the hyphenated stuff so yeah. that you can preserve your energy to ask me about the things that actually matter <laughs> to me, well, like hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Who's but, my team? But if we're... It, it, it's impossible. It, it is impossible to do that, though, right? It's impossible for you to walk down the street and for people not to look at you and immediately say, "Attractive brown woman." It's impossible. Well, not I don't to know do about that. the attractive part. Believe me, it's possible for people not to do that. But, um, but I think you've got a really important point here. From an evolutionary point of view, it's true that we as human beings have not evolved to the point where we're beyond tribalism. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't mean that we can't do better. And it doesn't mean that we can't celebrate each other's individuality as much as we celebrate that about our cultures or about our parents' cultures, mm -hmm. which you know deserves celebration. I think the key here is to ask questions about one another rather than to assume or make statements. And when somebody says something or even asks a question that is somehow offensive, instead of walking away muttering racist or yelling racist, why not actually engage? Engage. Exactly. And get to the heart of it in order to understand their unique point of view. Isn't that what diversity is about? So, you know, the time for multiculturalism has, has gone, it's come and gone, and it was great while it lasted. But as citizens, and what is it to be a citizen? It is to participate. Mm -hmm. You can't do that if you are uh, too fearful of saying the wrong thing. The time for us as citizens to go from multiculturalism to diversity has arrived. Irshad, as always, you give us lots to think about. The name of the book is Allah, Liberty and Love, The Courage to Reconcile Faith and Freedom, Irshad Manji. Always great having you back here in the studio. Thanks so much. I look forward to our next encounter. <laughs> Amen.